Okay, hello everyone. So we want to thank uh, Rene Decker for the keynote. Um, his team at the Biodiversity Museum Natural Naturalas is doing um, incredible work. Um, and we really see what he's doing for 2D digitization as a model for what could be done for 3D, for scaling up 3D. So the narrative arc of this conference, we, we started off yesterday by talking about what we've accomplished here at the Smithsonian in scanning these 20 objects, telling these amazing stories, um, launching the 3D Explorer, and making this data uh, downloadable for educational um, and non-commercial use. So it was a big day for us yesterday, and today is almost more of a, um, a reality check of sorts. It's, we, we've accomplished a lot, but we want to make it clear that we are essentially at the ground floor. So this is only the beginning. Um, and there's a lot of problems that need to be solved. So if we're going to scale up digitization at the Smithsonian, specifically 3D digitization for the purpose of this panel, um, we, we need help from partners. And we have an amazing panel here for you today. So I want to start off by um, setting the context. And we have a, a video that we've produced along with uh, PCI Communications. Um, and they've done an amazing job producing five videos about our project. So this video is about 3D digitization and collections. And again, we want to uh, specifically thank PCI Communications for doing an amazing job. So uh, sit back and enjoy. I could go on and on and on for hours to try and capture the diversity of the collections. Today, the Smithsonian is the largest museum and research complex in the world. Um, the Smithsonian collections currently total some 137 million objects and specimens, 164,000 cubic feet of archival material, and more than 1.8 million volumes of library material. I think it is accurate to say that the Smithsonian documents the world around us from A to Z and is available for us to learn from and to engage with because we hold the collections in trust for the American people. It's really tremendously important for us to find a technique that can bring that collection to our audiences in a way that is compelling. With all the diversity of the types of things we hold, 3D imaging will let those be made available more broadly. The beauty of this technology is that it does basically put museums internationally into one global environment. We've got collections that we've acquired over um, 100 years ago that now we can rethink and relook at, reinterpret, uh, because this technology gives us um, much more capability of studying those objects. You have a lot of tools at your disposal that allow you to really get into that object. It provides uh, researchers, uh, curators, uh, enhanced ability to analyze the objects themselves, revealing secrets or ideas or concepts that we wouldn't really know otherwise. And ultimately, this connection with the object is what we want to foster. We're on a journey. We want to find out what people are doing with this data. We want to find out how we can optimally support our audiences in doing whatever they want to do with these objects. I think that's our ultimate goal. And everything we do in, in curatorship or uh, collections management is with the goal of providing access to those collections. If we were able to digitize an object every minute and we worked 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it would take us 270 years to finish digitizing this collection. It's really important for people to realize how big this challenge is. The more that I've seen the work that's been applied here at the Smithsonian, um, I'm just really wowed by the technology itself. It already has revealed in its use in the last few years uh, that it's an invaluable tool to the mission of the Smithsonian. And I think that we need to continue to invest in these resources, whether it's uh, the technology itself as it improves, as well as providing the manpower on the street to be able to actually apply it, meeting that mandate of uh, improving access to the collection.
Okay, who's inspired? Let's, let's 3D scan the collection. <laughs> now, unfortunately, actually doing that and implementing that is, uh, represents many, many challenges, um, and challenges that no one museum uh, could solve on their own. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to switch to the Prezi. Thank you. Um, so we're honored to have um, uh, some, some really great panelists for this uh, panel. So the idea is that this is going to be a brainstorm. So we're going to talk about some of the challenges. Um, we have Doug Pritchard. Uh, so Doug is the senior lecturer at Heroet Watt University in Edinburgh, an honorary research fellow at the University of Glasgow, Scotland. Um, so Doug has been involved in the planning and execution of uh, many large-scale urban landscape uh, 3D documentation projects. So he's done a lot of work with SciArc. SciArc recently released um, the SciArc 500 Challenge, where they're looking to scan 500 cultural heritage sites in the next five years. So that's very ambitious. Um, and also the Scottish 10. So the Scottish 10 is a government, Scottish government-backed effort to 3D document um, all of Scotland's cultural heritage sites. Quick glance at some of their work, but Doug will be uh, speaking to this in just a moment. So what Doug represents for this panel is the ability to scan really big things. So the Smithsonian's collection is incredibly vast and varied. Um, so we have lots of really small things, and we have some really big things. We have the largest historic aircraft collection in the world. Um, we have automobile collections, we have buildings, um, and we have thousands of scientific sites um, all over the world. Uh, Herb Mashner. So Herb is the director of Idaho State University Center for Archaeology, Materials, and Applied Spectroscopy, spectroscopy um, and the Idaho Museum of Natural History. So Herb Mashner um, represents uh, scaling up of natural history collections. So Herb, Herb has set the ambitious goal of capturing 40,000 natural history specimens in 3D over the next three to four years. So again, some really big ambitious, ambitious plans here. And we'll be hearing more about Herb's work in just a moment. So again, what Herb represents for this panel is the 3D scanning of natural history collections. And of course, the Smithsonian has a very large natural history collection. Uh, Rolf Mueller. Rolf is the Associate uh, Professor, Department of Mechanical Engineering at Virginia Tech, and Taishan Professor of Shandong University, Virginia Tech International Laboratory. Um, so Rolf and his students, they've created um, some amazing concepts for micro CT scanning natural history uh, specimens, specifically wet specimens, and developing a robotic production chain with a possible throughput of 17,000 captures per year. Um, so with Rolf, um, he's micro CT scanning uh, uh, wet specimens, which are very difficult to document. And he's documenting, he's looking to document them in 3D using micro CT scanning. And he's also addressing the object handling problem. So if you're going to scan lots of things, that's one of the issues. How do you get the object safely from where they reside in the collection to the scanners themselves? And of course, Paul DeBevec, I'm sure many of you have um, heard his amazing keynote yesterday. So Paul is the Associate Director for Graphics Research University and of Southern California Institute for Creative Technologies and Research Professor. So Paul's light stage technology could be adapted to rapid 3D capture systems. Um, so that's, we, we see these, uh, this group of people here, our colleagues, you know, it, it could be a fantastic combination to help solve some of the problems or a lot of the problems for 3D scanning uh, the huge collection at the Smithsonian. So at this point, I'd like to invite the panelists up on stage. Um, just give an overview of your work and, and how that could, um, how some of the work you've done with Scottish Ten and SciArc could um, be adapted towards the Smithsonian's problems. Sure, 100 buildings within the city center of Glasgow. Um, we developed three models, uh, but the biggest challenge at the time was the high detailed version of the city. So what we did, um, what we had to provide was um, uh, photorealistic, dimensionally accurate models of all the 1,200 buildings as well as the roadways, terrains, and all that kind of stuff, um, right down to window mullions and um, uh, cornices and the facade details. Um, 
In 2006, we were one of the earliest adopters of terrestrial scanning for urban visualization, and we purchased a Leica Scan Station 1, and we went through the city of Glasgow, um, scanning the, each building, um, and then incorporating that data with aerial LIDAR and GPS to build uh, a virtual representation of the city. Um, the urban model was completed in 2008, and it's currently being used by the team at Development and Regeneration Services at Glasgow City Council. Um, the model's using, being used for a variety of purposes, both in terms of um, conservation, because there's a number of conservation areas within the city of Glasgow, but for the most part, it's being used for design review uh, within the planning uh, and architectural community, as well as within council. Um, one of the unique things that occurred in the development of that model is that although I'm at an art school, um, we developed a permanent team of visualization experts who focused on just laser scanning and 3D modeling. And that team was fantastic. And the result of the work um, with the urban model really prepared us well for the work that we eventually started doing with Historic Scotland, SciArc, and um, uh, the Scottish 10. So just to kind of fast track slightly, um, halfway through the urban model, we were introduced to a gentleman, or I was introduced to a gentleman by the name of David Mitchell. Um, and he looked at the work, saw the immediate application for heritage, and then began, began testing us. So we started off with a small project on the Isle of Butte, a metal canopy, and then eventually moving up to, um, we did projects like a, a Highlands, uh, a wool mill up in Highlands. Um, a, a number of Pictish uh, artifacts, a cross, and um, Stirling Castle, and then eventually Roslyn Chapel. Um, through David, and then uh, in Historic Scotland, and in particular through the Scottish Government, we received support, enthusiastic support, in our heritage visualization efforts. And with SciArc, and with um, uh, the Art School, and Historic Scotland, we began a project called the Scottish Ten. Um, and this is an amazing project. Uh, what we had to do was um, digitally document the five Scottish World Heritage Sites, and that's um, uh, everything from New Lanark, St Kilda, Neolithic Orkney, uh, Antonine Wall, and Old Newtown of Edinburgh. Um, so that's using terrestrial scanners, um, aerial LIDAR to document these sites, digital photography. Um, and then what was very strange at the time was that the government said, we would like you to do five international sites. And this is, was really unique. Um, so the first site that we did was Mount Rushmore, and you could see the, some of the images behind me. Uh, Mount Rushmore was the first one we did with SciArc, and that was a, an incredibly challenging project, um, a massive project, as you'd imagine. Um, since then, we've done uh, Rani Ki Vav, uh, the Queen Stepwell in Gujarat, India. Uh, the Eastern Qing Tombs in China. Uh, earlier this year, um, the Sydney Opera House was scanned. Um, and there's a fifth site that has yet to be named, and Historic Scotland is, is looking into uh, possible candidates. Um, the Scottish 10 project, I think, is incredibly unique in that it is about the government trying to push innovation. And at the same time, the return on the government's investment in the project uh, is about the relationship of Scotland to these countries uh, where these sites exist and also how to um, exchange, create a, a meaningful exchange between the state agency, Heritage Agency, Historic Scotland, and um, uh, uh, the various local agencies. Um, now, going kind of where I am right now, um, I've been actively involved with SciArc. We carry on, uh, we do uh, work with SciArc, um, but most recently now I've joined Harriet Watt University with the idea of establishing a visualization uh, lab and unit there to carry on work in heritage, um, uh, architectural and, and urban visualization. All right, thank you, Doug. Um, so next I'd like to introduce Rolf Mueller. He's the Associate Professor of Depar in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at Virginia Tech. So Ralph, if you could tell us a little bit, yep, and your slides will come up in just one moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, the path that has taken me to the, this event today that started actually out as being a user of digital information on, on, on animals, right? So my, my work was uh, understanding mechanical sorry. structures sorry. in the, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, these, these are not my slides. Mm -hmm. so. We'll get your slides up in just a moment. Yeah. You, are, you are not Herb Maschner, you That's are right. Rolf Mueller. 
<laughs> so maybe I'll give it a second here to sort that out and then I'll narrate as you can see what I'm talking about. Yes, that's okay. okay. I think now we see the, uh, okay, good, and now I have control here. So this is sort of the research that I started out with, looking at the biosonar system of bats, how mechanical structures in that system actually affect the sonar performance. And that work let me appreciate very quickly uh, that uh, animal specimens, such as these bat specimens, they have uh, outer values. So there's these structures where bats that emit the sound through the nostrils. They have some little megaphone structures. You can see that here in that example specimen, with, which is actually here from the Smithsonian. And uh, so they have outer values that you want to capture if you digitize them, but they also have obvious inner values. So there's a, a skeleton in, in vertebrates, right inside the skull there's a brain, right? and these are all very important organs, and you want, obviously you want to capture those, and you want to capture the relationship, right? For instance, if you look at the skull, or right, the head of a bat, right, it is a couple of machines put together in one, right? It is a sonar machine, uh, this, these outer structures, uh, vocal um, voice box, and these type of things, uh, vocal tract, uh, and it is a, it's a, it's an eating machine, the, the jaws and, and the throat and these things, and it is uh, also a signal processing machine, the brain, right? and, and having put all this functionality together in one spot, that's a, that's a very uh, challenging thing that nature has accomplished here, and that if you have a visualization or, uh, of data like the one that I'm showing you here, this is possible, right? because you can really uh, get uh, these different, to these different structures uh, in one concept. And that's not just true for vertebrates, I mean, it's very obvious that in a vertebrate you have a skeleton, so you want to capture the skeleton. But if you look at uh, invertebrates, so this, this is work from a colleague, Jake Soha, um, he is interested in, in beetles. Right? So if you see a beetle, well, you know, you take a picture of a beetle, you can see it from the outside, maybe 3D. Uh, that's it, right? That's all you need to know about the beetle. But if you look at the right side here, this is the uh, piping, the plumbing that, uh, that the beetle uses to distribute oxygen. Uh, throughout its body, right? and so it has a, a, an amazing system for doing this, and that's from my colleague and I, we are engineers, so for engineers that's really interesting, right? uh, how can you move liquid so efficiently if you, if you try to do some solution like that for ventilation, right? it, it would be an absolute nightmare, but the beetle uh, gets that done, and gets it done very efficiently, so that could be a model um, for uh, move, my, what is called microfluidics, moving liquid on a small scale. And so this is the kind of information that I see in those specimens and that, that I think we, we should really try to get out. So that's sort of the, the premise. And again, I started as a user uh, of this data and then talking to people here at the Smithsonian, I understood what challenges they face and I started to think maybe with my background, is there something that I can do to help? So I looked at this entire process that you have to go through if you want to digitize specimens. So it starts with a specimen in a collection, then you retrieve uh, that uh, specimen, and then finally uh, you load it into a scanner. And, uh, and then, of course, you have to reverse the process and unload it and, and put it back. And so I was uh, thinking, well, where could I put myself to use? Right? So the first thing would be, could we automate the retrieval of the specimen from the collection? And the answer is, it is possible, very big online companies, vendors, where they have done that, but it's just very, very expensive to do anything like that because it takes a new building and plus repackaging all the animals. The other end is sort of at the area of the scanner. First thing I noticed, that's not in my area, so how to make scanners fast is not what I do. Uh, I also think there's some limitations, right? If you want to capture a lot of data, it will, it will take some, some time. So the opportunity that I have seen is to work in the area of loading and unloading the scanner. Can we do something there? And so what my student and, uh, students and I have come up with, come up with a concept how we could automate that process. And the basic idea is to decouple the work of the human operator from operating the scanner. And that makes sense whenever the time that the scanner needs to scan the object is a significant portion of what it takes the human to load and uh, to, to feed uh, and retrieve the specimen from that scanner. And I think if you really want to collect a lot of information on a specimen, that's going to be the case for a long time that that is actually a significant portion. So we have worked on making this overall concept. You see a rendering here, and we have also uh, worked on some 
sort of key pieces, right? A lot of what you see in this picture here is things that you can buy not exactly off the shelf because it's not a consumer good, but you can order it from a, from a company, you can buy it. But there are some uh, key components uh, that are just for handling specimens, and, and that's something that my students and I have thought a lot about, have designed a lot of concept for, th for that, and that we have also have built. We had a version that we presented earlier this year here of, of sort of uh, very early alpha version prototypes, and we are now working on the next generation of functional prototypes. So that's where I stand and where I come from. All right, thank you, Rolf. <clears throat> so Herb, we'll get your slides up. In uh, 2005, I found myself leading a large National Science Foundation funded biocomplexity project in the Bering Sea um, on the Aleutian Islands. And one of the goals of the project was to use the hundreds of thousands of bird, mammal, and fish bones coming from these archaeological sites to reconstruct a 7,000 year environmental history of the North Pacific in relation to both commercial uh, species and endangered species. Um, a colleague from the Canadian Museum of Civilization who was working with me and I realized very early that the 180 to 200 different species we were finding these middens, there was no comparative collection anywhere in the world that would allow us to do a complete analysis that had all of the taxa, but also all the different ages of those taxa and di different sizes and different sexes of the, of the sea mammals and other kinds of things. And realizing this wasn't a, a um, problem of just our project, we began looking around for various uh, opportunities. At about this same time, I inherited a small 3D scanning group at Idaho State University that had originally been founded by a former Smithsonian employee named Ralph Chapman, who did some early work in digi digitization here at the Smithsonian. And then with just a couple of small, I think they had a Next Engine scanner and a Cyberware scanner from the early 2000s, and a couple of computers, and, and one t a couple of technicians that had a little bit of skill in such things. Um, and putting those two things together, we realized there were some opportunities. And uh, in 2007, the National Science Foundation funded the lab, my lab, to put every bone from every Arctic mammal, bird, and fish online in a hierarchical database, um, Arctic and subarctic, um, terrestrial and marine, so that anyone anywhere in the world can do their own analyses, because the National Science Foundation was faced with a whole bunch of scholars that also did not have access to comparative material. And thus, the Virtual Zoo Archaeology of the Arctic Project was born. And today, we have um, nearly 8,000 3D scans, 60,000 2D images, all online in a hierarchical system that anyone can get on and search and do comparative analysis. Um, in 2007, or two, no, excuse me, uh, three, year, three and a half years ago, when I took over the Idaho Museum of Natural History as the director, I moved the 3D scanning facility into the museum as a subunit in one of the divisions of the museum and began what we call the Democratization of Science Project, a goal to put several hundred thousand of our museum specimens online, mostly in 3D, but except for things like herbarium sheets and, and such, 2D, um, put up online so that anyone anywhere in the world could do their own analyses. And it's a very different scanning project than most. It's, 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 for 3D, it's very different. Um, we now have almost 15,000 items online in various ways or scanned and going up online shortly. Um, we have uh, six full-time employees and seven or eight half-time and student interns, um, including a student intern coming from Naturalist, actually, to work with us uh, in a few weeks. But the, the goal of the project is now to do entire repositories. And so, as opposed to the virtual museum concept, we're, we're really dealing with the virtual repository, where we take a, a one of the museum's important collections, whether it be archaeological or paleontological or vertebrate osteology, what it might be, and do the entire collection so that any scientist, whether it's a student in Greenland or a researcher in the Ukraine or someone in South America or Australia, can get online, do their own studies with online comparative analysis tools, including 2D and 3D measurement tools, exported uh, data to uh, spreadsheets or databases and, and other kinds of things. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's what we're really pursuing as kind of the museum model for the future. Um, some of you might have seen the fir uh, first draft of the, uh, the method and theory of this uh, approach in Museum Magazine last spring, I think in the March issue. Um, and we're really kind of taking it further now with uh, a number of foundations that have donated to create th these virtual repositories. We're uh, faced with 
problem of scale for sure. And we have, I know I've spoken with many of you. Um, we um, have been very successful using Faro scanners and um, Geomagic, and that's worked out very well. We, uh, though, are, have a problem. We're getting ready to start a big uh, international project called the Virtual Repository of Arctic Archaeology, where we plan to put a half a million items online from the 40 most important archaeological sites in the Arctic um, in 3D, color mapped 3D images. Um, and we're hoping to turn this into a 10-year project and have it finished. And so um, the, the ability to pipeline some of this material, uh, remove humans from the actual scanning and do it more automated is absolutely critical to us as well. All right. Thanks so much, Herb. Uh, so next up, uh, Paul DeBevec, Associate Director of Graphics uh, for Graphics Research, University of Southern California Institute for Creative Technologies. So Paul, if you wanted to, I know we've already seen your amazing keynote presentation, but if you could talk about a little bit about some of the challenges, yeah. uh, that would be great. So I, I think this panel is very important because uh, it's talking about how to make these technologies uh, practical for the vast collections that are out there. And uh, in, uh, in uh, my job as a researcher, you know, often our job is to you know, get a research paper out, and if we're trying to develop a new kind of technology, uh, our goal is just to get it to work, you know, once or twice or three times to do the results in a paper um, by hook and by crook just to prove that it's possible. And that's a very far thing from figuring out how to do things in high volume reliably at museum quality resolution. So a lot of our results are actually a little bit low res uh, and we work kind of, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to figure out what we're doing in the process. In fact, in the research world, if we know what we're doing, uh, we're not doing the right thing. We have to always be doing things where we're not quite sure and get outside the comfort zone. Uh, but that's still uh, useful. And because we are very interested in seeing these things get out into the real world, we actually do production projects where uh, we try to use the technology. So in the case of the, uh, the Parthenon project, uh, I think it took us you know, four days to scan the Parthenon sculptures. We actually built our own 3D scanner, specifically thinking about how many linear feet of Parthenon frieze there are and how fast we can go through a museum and how fast the projector needs to change patterns in order to do that. Uh, and then scanning the Parthenon itself, it's like we had a certain amount of budget from Topon printing to get out to Athens. We had to scan the Acropolis in four days. That's how much money we had to pay for hotels and, and things. And so we chose the resolution, we made compromises, and we used the piece of equipment, the, the quantum point laser scanner that was uh, much faster than other ones at the time in order to do it. Uh, something that's a bit of an asymmetry is how long it takes to acquire the data and then how long it takes to process it into a usable model. So uh, even though it would only take us four days to scan stuff, then it would be um, you know, work by graduate students and interns, um, maybe a person year of effort to put together all of the Parthenon sculptures into models. This is 10 years ago and the software is fortunately much better now. Or a person year of effort to put together the Parthenon uh, model. Um, but uh, eventually we have, this, uh, uh, we have this data and the software will just continue to improve and it's so much more automatic at this point. Uh, through our industry collaborations, we've actually developed some pipelines that can really work in a good way. So the first scans we did of faces in the light stage with the high resolution geometry, that would take um, you know, maybe a, a couple hours to scan the actor, but uh, to do just a couple of facial expressions maybe two weeks to process the data. And since we've been continuing to do that and we get a bit of funding back um, to improve the pipelines, uh, we now can scan an actor um, you know, today and within a couple days have 30 expressions, which is enough to do a whole alphabet of facial expression processed and delivered to uh, a client. So working with industry has been very helpful for us. And our glasses, uh, or our specular object scanner, which I showed scanning the, the pair of sunglasses, uh, actually, that project was sponsored by an interesting company called Glasses.com, which has an iPad app that lets you buy glasses over the internet. And since you can't try them on uh, physically at first, uh, they have a really nice augmented reality application where you shoot a video of your head nodding back and forth, and it detects your face. It actually does a basic 3D reconstruction of the shape of your face, and then it renders glasses digitally on your head with shading and shadows. That's pretty impressive um, and fun to play with. The um, the, the requirement for that, they wanted to be able to you know, get glasses from Ray-Ban and Oakley and uh, very quickly digitize them, put them into their application. 
they said you know, they needed to scan the glasses in 10 minutes and the data had to be processed in 20 minutes with the idea that you'd process on two computers simultaneously so you could keep a pipeline where every 10 minutes a new pair of glasses gets scanned. And at that point when you have a, um, a goal like that, it does become a research problem to figure out how you can do it in this amount of time. So you figure out how long it takes to spin the arm of the glasses scanner, we figured out we could scan it a second, that means in 10 minutes we can do 600 turns. Uh, how do we scan everything we need to know about a pair of glasses in 600 photographs? And we knew we had to change all the angles. That's why there's five cameras on it to do it simultaneously. And why we're using spherical harmonic illumination instead of individual light directions. And that actually motivated uh, the research uh, quite a bit. So sometimes having these requirements for volume can be quite helpful. Um, I think a point to remember as we start thinking let's scan an entire collection is that the technology is going to continue to improve and the scans that we do next year are going to seem you know, low resolution and incomplete uh, five to ten years from now. But if you think of the history of historical documentation where we went from you know, just the written word describing you know, what a sculpture might have looked like in antiquity to a drawing that might have been passed on, to copies, to black and white photos, to color photos, to 3D scans. Usually at any given point in history, the first time that it was described in some new way or with new technology becomes historically relevant. So that shouldn't prevent us from trying to do these captures and from also very importantly saving the raw data that you might be able to produce into better models uh, in the future. And the final thing I wanted to mention is that as we acquire geometry and color maps, we should also remember that you know, there are the reflectance properties of you know, which parts are shiny, which parts are scuffed, which parts look like they're made out of metal or leather. And we don't have great technologies available for that right now, but having the photo documentation and the raw data would be helpful. And working together to come up with interchange formats for reflectance properties and materials will be helpful for helping the archiving in those directions in the future. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, so, I guess we can kick things off and just open up some questions to the panel. So, the Smithsonian has 137 million objects in our collection. Obviously, that is not going to be the goal we're going to set initially for, for 3D documentation. Um, but what's, what's really, in, you know, intimidating is that the, the sheer numbers and also the diversity of our collection. So, how do we even begin thinking about that? How do we start to how many different 3D capture solutions will we be employing? Um, so I guess I, I also want to talk to um, Doug and, you know, is, you know, what I wanted to point to was the Scottish 10. So that was mm -hmm. a government-backed um, endeavor. Um, so where do we, how do we start thinking about resources? Um, for scaling up, because that's, that is an issue and that has to be addressed. So is, if you could talk a little bit about um, the Scottish 10 and how that project started. Sure. Um, well, the project, uh, there's two components to that. One is the work that we were doing at the time at the art school um, and the urban model for Glasgow, which uh, was a, an amazing project. That was government funded, uh, uh, funded uh, to, to create this virtual representation of the city that was um, both money from the city and then also from the European Union. Um, the Scottish 10 came through the Scottish government um, and in particular through one individual who was the education minister or who was the current education minister but previously he was the uh, culture minister. Uh, that was Mike Russell and he really saw the importance of documenting uh, Scottish architectural heritage um, so he was the biggest uh, promoter of this. And what was of interest to him was the precision, the detail, the accuracy um, to capture the structure um, and the environment that that structure sits in um, for future generations. And there's a number of sites in Scotland which um, are potentially threatened due to global warming or sea level rise. Uh, and the idea of capturing them as quickly as possible uh, was a priority for the Scottish Government. The other side of it was on the international side uh, was this uh, idea of exchange and that was very important. So when we were on site in, at Rushmore or the other sites, um, it's this technical exchange that we have uh, that's very valuable. So we learn from the other sites what are the best processes um, for documentation and visualization and then also the ultimate archiving of the data. 
So I also want to talk about, you know, let's, let's really dig into the challenges. So if we could hear from maybe each of the panelists about some of the specific challenges that you face. Um, so what I, what's really interesting to uh, Rolf Mueller's work is that what he is tackling is not just the 3D capture portion. So he's working with an off-the-shelf micro CT scanning solution. Um, but what he's also addressing is the object handling. So if we could talk about some of the challenges about just getting the objects um, to the scanners, because that in and of itself is a, a huge logistical challenge, especially if you're dealing with specimens um, that are delicate, uh, wet specimens and glass jars. Um, obviously, not a lot of care needs to be taken. Um, so I'd like to hear about uh, some of the challenges that you faced, Rolf, in uh, moving collections from one place to another and getting them documented. Yes, yeah, so, thank you very much. It's, a, it's indeed a good question. We had quite a bit of discussion here with uh, people who are in charge of these collections or uh, users of these collections. And uh, I mean, it, indeed, it emerged very quickly uh, that obviously there's a lot of value to these objects. So I remember when my students and I, we had our first sketchbooks with ideas. There was uh, sort of bats flying or, or specimens that were flying through the air and uh, sort of being catapulted through the air. And that was very quickly, uh, <laughs> the students liked the idea, but it, it was very quickly something that we shelved just because these specimens are delicate. So what we try to do in our design is sort of strike a balance that we say, okay, there has to be a human in the chain, first of all, because we probably have to make a selection that was uh, said in the introduction this morning uh, that uh, uh, these specimens come in sort of in lots where you could have one jar with specimens that are the same species, same location, same time of collection. So maybe we want to make a selection because uh, the uh, scanning all 137 million items is out of the question, right? so we have to be selective so the human can make that selection. The second thing is the human can sort of make a decision which specimen to take, how, how to mount it, how to place it. Uh, and, and so our concept is that we let the human make that selection, let the, give the human a nice interface to quickly place the specimen. We think uh, a person should be able to do that with our concept in at most 90 seconds, one and a half minutes, put the specimen there, get the label uh, information, and, and then pass it on to an automated setup. So the, and then the idea is that while the specimen is in the automated area, it is encapsulated in a basket that is constructed in a safe manner. So it's like, a, like the cabin of a car right? that gives you a safety. And, and so when the robot handles the specimen, it never comes close to the, the specimen itself. That's sort of the, the division between human and, and uh, automated setup that we made to sort of address the issues of selection, of having sort of a bit of control, and also handling fragile specimens. OK, thank you, Rolf. So I think some of the problems we've heard so far, um, you know, we have an object handling problem. Uh, we need to be able to scan things in a much quicker way. We've heard Rene Decker talk about um, assessing 3D documentation three years ago, and their team decided that um, it just wasn't time yet. So how do, we, how do we determine when it is time? And Paul mentioned um, that the technology is evolving. So how do we make that choice? And when do we know that you know, the technology is there, knowing that it's going to keep evolving? Like, when do we leap in? Um, as uh, you know, a really huge institution, um, when do smaller museums decide to leap in? So I'm just, yeah. So, um, so one of the things that's actually nice about uh, you know, the collections is that they're so varied and there's different kinds of objects in them. And some of the objects in the collections, like the, the Cosmic Buddha sculpture, um, are very good cases for certain kinds of 3D scanning right now right. because there's well-defined surfaces and the things that are most of interest for the history are you know, what the inscriptions are, what the carvings are, um, the, the surface quality that we have today isn't necessarily exactly the surface quality or even all that even close to the surface quality that there was originally. So even if we're not getting every detail about just how you know, shiny or rough it is, that's, that's still probably not the most important thing for documenting. So scanning, you know, diffuse, opaque, even very complicated shaped things right now, that's a slam dunk for, yeah. for technology, relatively speaking. Scanning uh, things like um, you know clothing and feathers and stuff that has fur and hair on it, these are also very important artifacts. And that stuff's hard at this point. So 
you could decide, okay, well, let's wait five or 10 years. The, the good news is that as you start getting successful digitization happening on certain parts of the collection, that's gonna increase interest, lessons are gonna be learned from that, and then right. the other thing I think is a, a much better chance of kind of following from there. Right, great, thank you. Um, and then, Herb, um, you know, your team has been doing an amazing job of scaling up uh, digitization using laser arm scanners, so using humans, yet you guys are achieving uh, a pretty high throughput. Um, you mentioned in your introduction that you're looking at automating that system. Um, how do you see yourself and your team automating that system? And do you see yourself sticking with laser scanning? Because obviously with laser scanning, we're capturing the geometry of an object, but quite often we're not capturing color information. So how important is color information? Um, I know that your team is working on the manual texture mapping, so I'd, I would like to hear more from you, Herb, about how you envision um, scaling up um, and where are you going in terms of geometric capture compared to color capture, and do you see those two things sort of merging in your workflow? Well, <clears throat> let's put it in the context of the kinds of things we want to scan. Sure. Right? And so to go back to your previous question, you know, you guys talk about having 137 million items. There's, 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 there would be absolutely no interest in having all of that digitized, right? And that, that, that wouldn't, the world wouldn't even be interested in having 100% of yes, that Yes, there's digitized. a lot of redundancy. So, and then if yep. you take out all the things that would never be scanned 3D, like your barium sheets, which you guys have millions of, um, yep. uh, we found fish bones, for instance, completely irrelevant at 3D. They're 2D, they're 2D scanned. Um, and there's many other there's many other things too uh, that would be 2D. Then you get down to the point where you're going to pick certain collections, perhaps that have the most interest to science. You're going to bring scientists in, and you're going to say this collection is going to be critical in the next 10 years. We need this one scanned so the world can do the analysis. And you're going to have that kind of trade. And that's that's what we've done. Now, given those kinds of things, those most important collections, the ones that we really want the 3D data, and the scientists, scientific community wants it, the public wants to see it, and other aspects of that. Um, there are certain characteristics that are very important. Accuracy uh, is important, and we're, we're already getting five micron accuracy with our fair arms, and we do not need any more. We can't even serve any better accuracy than that. Um, it's more accuracy than you can see with the naked eye. And so we don't, for that, we don't need any more accuracy. It, 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 we're, we're perfectly good. Um, now, the color problem is, is a real problem for us because we're working on the model that these museum models need to be what we call virtual surrogates. And it's a term we use for basically an exact representation of the item in full color. Um, size, shape, volume, color. Uh, of course, we're not getting texture, but we can play around with that another time. Um, and, it's, and it's pretty fast. You know, we, we, can go, we go down right into the collection, set up a fair alarm, open a drawer, and we can scan the whole drawer, and it goes, it goes very quickly, um, it, at least on the human side. The our human dream, side, but, yep. our dream, sure. We would love to have a machine we set it on a turntable, it scans it, multiple scanners and multiple color cameras, automating the, uh, not only the merging of all the, all the meshes, but adding the color onto them. And I even saw a demo of a machine in Marseille last week at the Digital Heritage Conference um, where it was trying to do this and it got to the end and the computer actually determined all the holes in the mesh and then brought out an automated arm that would scan all the holes and then redo the color. Okay, we would love to have something like that. Time-wise, you know, we can do, we can do finished, finished models ready for online of arrowheads. We can do six an hour. A whale skull now still takes us three days, four days. Right, yeah, that's and, amazing. And, and then imagine, about, imagine looking, we, we saw Renee Decker's presentation. Imagine combining some of Renee Decker's methodology um, and automating that system. We saw sort of the, the paper going through the conveyor belt. Imagine, you know, that could be uh, arrowheads going through the conveyor belt. And maybe there's just a laser line scanner. Exactly. So these and, are... And we're at the scale now. If we're going to do this half a million artifact project for the National Science Foundation, for the Arctic, uh, for, and for a bunch of Native American groups and, and Canadian groups, um, the technology doesn't really exist for us to do that successfully right now. It just doesn't exist. Right. And so I've been talking to industry and I've been talking to academic partners and, and trying to come up with plans for how we might do this, but it, it right. doesn't exist. So it doesn't exist and it needs to be developed. It needs to be developed for a specific set of users, right? And right now, 
we all find, most of us up on the stage, um, we find ourselves in a position where we're adapting from other fields, right? So except for Paul, where he's sort of making things from scratch, but you're sort of really, you know, pushing, pushing the envelope and in the research phase. Whereas, you know, I think the Smithsonian, um, Herb, Rolf, um, and Doug, we're sort of in a position where we're borrowing tools that were designed for completely different uses, right? So with Doug, um, you know, you're using a tool that's divide, you know, designed for surveying largely. It's not necessarily designed for cultural heritage. So we were talking last night about, you know, the color capture with long range scanning. It's just not there. It's something that surveyors don't address. So this is a tool that really isn't designed for our applications. Rolf is working on a system to automate micro CT scanning. Um, and of course, due to budget constraints, you know, he's not able to design a CT scanning system. So we're buying a turnkey system. Um, and Herb, to your point, you know, we're, we're using laser arm scanners just like our team at the Smithsonian is. And those, those tools were designed uh, for, for manufacturing um, and part inspection. And um, sort of an awakening the Smithsonian 3D team has had recently was, you know, in working with Autodesk and we were creating the 3D viewer, you know, that's a delivery system, but it was a really amazing spot to be in because for the first time we are, you know, we're not making calls, but we're, we're putting together the wish list. So the 3D Explorer was, you know, that was a fantastic experience for us. So if you did want a tool developed for you by industry, and we have some industry folks in the audience, you know, what would that tool look like? Let's get into specifics. So, so Doug, what, what are your needs for scanning really big things? Like, uh, well, very, on the hardware side, it would be um, obviously faster scanners, um, but that's fine. I mean, they, they've improved, uh, they keep improving yearly, but it, it's really the camera system that sits within the scanners. Um, to be able to do photogrammetry within a scanner or uh, higher resolution imagery, um, HDR, um, you know, these are kind of basic stuff. So high dynamic range imagery along yeah. with the geometry capture. Yeah. Right, that's um, something we're not seeing a lot of. No, right. uh, and I think that's back to what you're saying earlier is that yeah. it's that uh, the laser scanner is being driven by the survey industry. Right. Uh, their priorities are slightly different than heritage or, or say multimedia. Um, so I think having a scanner as a multimedia tool as opposed to a survey tool first would be uh, very advantageous. Um, hardware aside though, the biggest issue always is uh, the post-processing. So when right. you see the images of the Scottish 10 or of um, other work um, that's photorealistic and really beautiful, the scanning is a small component of it. Um, the, the rest of it is the post-processing of the data, which is, can be very, very difficult, um, and then the visualization of the data. And that, the pressure has to be put on the software companies to really you know, expedite the process. Yes, and we could, yes, we feel your pain. We, when we, the 1903 right flyer um, with the scan data processing that, that was, you know, six weeks of processing time, a two day capture, but six weeks of yeah. processing a billion points. Um, yeah, so, uh, and Rolf, I imagine with your system, you know, it's definitely, you know, faster, faster scan times for the micro CT. Uh, yeah. Herb, you know, you, you've already put out your, your dream machine uh, ideas out there. Um, you know, automating the system, um, in, introducing robotics, another level of automation. Um, well, we've, so, we've figured out how much it costs, too. Right, and I that's mean, important, you know, right, I mean, figuring out you know, what the costs are, because otherwise you're going into it blind, and right, that, that's and a key part of your planning. And so the, the Bones project we did, the Arctic Bones project, um, it's about... Um, between $20 and $700 a specimen. So a whale would be $700 to $1,000, and small scale bones would be, we can do for $16 to $20, sometimes $25 a specimen. Um, we need to cut that literally by an order of magnitude to do these big projects. Um, if I, I may also chime in on that uh, sure. for the automation part. I mean, scanner aside, of course, faster scanners, that is sort of a, a yeah. always on the wish list. But for the automation part, I think the situation is actually not that bad because the problem of moving specimens is the problem of moving small things. And that is something that is shared really by a very wide industry. So you can get a lot of those components like conveyor belts. Uh, robot arms with six degrees of freedom, linear tracks to mount them and then change their, uh, widen the envelope carousels for storing 
things. But so, so we can actually draw on all these components. The challenge is that, they, that we need to have a few key components that interact with the specimens that we need to design from scratch. And then, of course, we need to figure out the workflow and make them work together. But the pieces are there. So it's right. actually that, a, not that it bad a situation to be in. It, it takes some more work, I think, to get there, but we don't need to start or we don't need to hope that somebody will make a completely new tool for us. Right, so the adapting from other industries is still very valid mm -hmm. for you, Ralph, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Okay, that's a good point. Um, so I have, I have Paul right next to me, and you know, one thing, we, we've been watching your work with the light stages for some time now, and now I have the honor of sitting next to you, and I'm going to ask you the question about, you know, we, we thought about you know, having a light stage or some, a similar device here at the Smithsonian. Um, if we're loading that, what, how fast could we go, and if we're able to go really fast, and say we're scanning you know, the primate skull collection, and we start with a priority collection, like the, the type specimens of the primate skull collection. Um, how fast could we go, and what does that post-processing look like? So I, I think the, the, the version of it that's most relevant to the, the kinds of artifacts you have in your collection is the one that can do the continuous illumination, mm -hmm. because you know, when you're putting arbitrary things in there, sometimes stuff gets kind of shiny. We know that human skin is you know, not like a perfect mirror surface, so right. we know if the lights are 10 degrees apart, we're not going to see them separating out in the specular highlights. So that means that we, we have to do you know, continuous illumination around. One way to do it is a spinning arm. You can also move monitors around. There's some ways to do it with video projectors if you have them bright enough. Um, the system that we have you know, for the glasses is, is 10 minutes if we want to get around to the back of the object. It becomes 15 minutes if we want to get the top and the bottom. It's probably 20 minutes right now. Okay. And the post-processing is pretty fast. I think to do all of that would be maybe uh, a half hour if it gets adapted to you know those adding more cameras higher resolution cameras definitely mm -hmm. it creates more data but it means you can capture more uh, quickly so I think a system like that might be able to get at least a few artifacts a day but it's essentially a photogrammetric photogrammetric like solution or is it it's well it's a based non, on light field it's a non-contact right. solution and there's a couple different things that happen so there's, there's basically two kinds of light you can uh, light something with one is, is projected light that right. comes from a point and then it angularly varies over the object. So things like a, a laser stripe that moves across is that kind of illumination. That's good for getting geometry. And the other kind of light is light that envelops the object um, uh, from all angles and then kind of lights the entire thing spatially. And this is like observing how an image would reflect in the object. And that's good for getting reflectance properties. So the ideal device would have both of those. We found a way with glasses to do it just with the enveloping image of illumination, but I think the ultimate object would have some video projectors to get structured light patterns in there in combination with the, uh, the smooth spherical light around for reflectance. Right. Okay, great. So at this point, I want to kind of shift gears here and talk about, okay, we, we are looking at scaling up 3D digitization here at the Smithsonian, at other museums. Um, but who is the audience? Who are we doing this for? Why are we doing it? Um, so I'd just like it to ask a question to the panel, an open question. Um, what are the benefits of, of making large-scale museum collections available uh, to the public and to the, to the scientific world? Well, Herb, I'm going to point at you at this point. Yeah, okay. Um, well, th there, there are big benefits. One is the idea of group science, right? Big science. I mean, how many times have great discoveries not been made because someone in one part of the world doesn't have access to the information in another part of the world? And this is going to solve that. It's actually going to solve it, uh, especially for uh, really interesting things, archaeology, paleontology, the kinds of things that we can put online, uh, vertebrate zoology, whatever it might be. Um, on the totally opposite, well, built into that then is that it means that anybody can do science, any, any kid, any scholar, any politician that wants to get online and do their own stuff can do so, write their own papers, and we just sort it out in peer review. And, and there should be no fear of people t taking all the data and doing whatever they want with it. That's, that's their prerogative. Um, the other is the democratizing part, bringing it to the world, bringing it to the public, letting the public know what you have and why it's interesting. And, and the final thing is we do this because legislators and congressmen think it's really awesome. <laughs> and, 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 and um, you know, there's, it's, it's really, 
how do you make natural history or any kind of museum relevant for the 21st century? And this is gonna be it. This is our relevance, bringing it to the world. And, and, that, and I think for those four reasons, um, everybody should be doing it, it should be our model. Yeah, I, I agree, I like it. So, yeah, but yeah, once I, we, if, we, if we're able to, to solve this problem and we start mass 3D digitization, um, what is the importance of open data? So again, that's a question for the panel. So. I, I would want to draw attention, use that to draw attention to another group that maybe people don't uh, associate that much with, uh, say, natural history specimens, and that is engineers. Right? So, I mean, there's a big drive in engineering to look into inspiration from nature, right? So in, at Virginia Tech, we have about 50 faculty who are in that area of getting inspiration from nature. And of course, that means that you really, if you want to do an engineering analysis of a biological function, you need 3D shape. Right, and if you have that, you can do that. And, and, and bioinspiration is already pretty successful, right? If you check on your clothing, you probably have a little strip of Velcro there that's a bioinspired piece of technology. And I've seen economic predictions that I'm not sure if I should believe them, but that say sort of in 30 years, this will be more than $400 billion a year of a market. Right? And, and this would mean that a collection like the Natural History Collection of the Smithsonian could really become an enormous a uh, source of economic revenue, right? It's sort of like a natural resource right, for knowledge. Right? It's uh, just maybe as important as oil and gas, right? that you can actually go in and get that knowledge. And if you look at the moment how this invention from nature, innovation from nature, how that works is, people focus on one model system. Right? They see, okay, an engineer knows, oh, there's this one animal or this one plant that does this one th thing. Right? But if you walk through the collection here of the Natural History Museum, very right, quickly, you realize there's not this one animal. Right? There's sort of this whole tree of life with millions of species in it. And, and one thing that nature is really good at is taking those principles and adapting to different things. And engineers, and they're also good at that, but they usually usually have to have a new project, have a new sort of sponsorship to investigate that new problem, right? This idea of just recycling and redoing and adapting nature is much better than that. So that's where I see an enormous value in these natural history collections that could really help us to, to learn better how to innovate in technology. And for that, we need large-scale digitization. That's the only way we can sort of have big numerical engineering analysis programs run over these specimens and see what the trends are. So that's what the fact yeah, that I Yeah, that's fantastic. I think, um, well, distinguishing between, say, objects and environments, objects benefit from being in controlled environments. You know, we saw it during our tour where there are nice trays and everything. Architecture, heritage, uh, the buildings, the environments that the buildings sit in are entirely different. They are susceptible to weather, vandalism, uh, uh, global warming, as I mentioned before, uh, violence, war. Um, I think that's something um, to keep in mind. So to answer the question, who is the audience, I think one thing we have to consider is the future. So the object is controlled, you know, your, the, the, the slides that you have or the, the artifacts are in a nice controlled environment and they'll be there for years to come, buildings less so. So it's the future audience and this is where organizations like Historic Scotland or SciArc are very active in. And I think that's important, that we document structures, environments, the context in particular, I think that's very important, um, to a uh, level of detail so that the future generations um, can see what these buildings used to look like or what the environment looked like or what that neighborhood looked like. I think that's really important. Yeah, I think that's great. So, yeah, preserving our history for future generations. Um, and to Rolf's point, yeah, cre using 3D data or digitization, um, of the natural world as a national resource. I think that's, that's brilliant. I, I love that. So on the uh, open data yes. uh, point, um, I, I, I posted a link to 3d.si.edu where you can browse these models. Uh, and one of the, the first comments I got on that from a friend is like, can you download the models? And I was right. so happy to be able to say, yes, you can download the models. That is so cool. That makes somehow the entire experience so much more uh, satisfying that like if you want to check one of these out and, and, and take it home with you then that's that's available so that's a, a great thing that's uh, happened there um, I think in terms of the audience there's actually different requirements for 
um, you know, classrooms and, and individuals and then scientists as well. And it's nice that there's some overlap between what's interesting to science and what's useful for making a web application to explore these things. Uh, but it's important to note that also, um, you know, we think of photographs of an object as being very incomplete right now. It's like it's two-dimensional. It only shows in one lighting condition. It, it, it's got shadows and weird stuff in it. They're useful, but it's, it's, it's very incomplete. And unfortunately, the models that we're recording right now of objects are a bit better than photographs. But like if, if, if photographs are here and actually having the real object that you could theoretically do anything to is here, then 3D scans with color texture done at high quality are a, l a little bit of the way toward having the real thing. If you, if you digitize a, a World War I you know, fighter plane, um, your model is not going to be able to, you, you couldn't take like a, a virtual machine gun and shoot it up and see what the effects would be. If you have a model of the right flyer, which is amazing, you can't put 100-year-old you know, formula for gasoline in it and see what the, hear what the engine sounds like. As, as we go further forward, um, we will be able to digitize these things at that level of detail and the ability in a computer to do physical simulations that if you've, if you've captured Amelia Earhart's um, jacket, you could put on a virtual character and have them walk around with it and the way that it would deform mm -hmm. and, and the sounds that you would hear as you walked around it, that would be possible uh, at some point. So I think that it, this is going to have to keep up with technology and that what you do with a particular object, there should be something that you try to do in general, but then specific applications, um, you know, a particular, specific scientific application or dissemination application might need to do it in a particular way that's optimized for that. Right, right, I agree. And I think at this point, from the, the Smithsonian's uh, perspective, our team, you know, we're a small team, so right now we're we're sort of seeing the one act of 3D capture having many different uses. Right, so we see 3D scanning um, as a way to support both scientific research and also public access, but I could definitely see that being refined um, as, as it goes forward. Um, physics, the introduction of physics, um, that's, yeah, I love the idea, and the idea of turning on the right flyer. Um, and I think we're already starting to see some of those physics engines happen, right? I mean, we're seeing in a lot of modeling software, we can sort of calculate what materials will do under stress, right? And being able to sort of, you know, activate them or turn them on or make some sort of machinery, you know, move or come alive in 3D is, you know, we're starting to see that. So that's, that's not fantasy. That's, you know, that could be happening relatively soon. No, no that's definitely not. I mean, bed biosona that, that we work with, uh, that's, that's a feature, the acoustic properties of the bed biosona are entirely determined by the shape, right? It's just, mm -hmm. The shape, if you have the geometry, then you can predict what, how the sonar system works. So th there's definitely room for that. OK, so at this point, we could, we could move on and start thinking about next steps. So with 2D digitization rapid capture systems, um, they've existed for some time. Um, will they serve as a guide for, for scaling up 3D? So this is an open question for the panel. Like, does that, how relevant are those systems that exist now, and can they be adapted? Um, and we could also, you know what, I'm going to save that question, because we're about to have Renee Decker come up on stage, and I think he would be the perfect person to answer that question. Um, so. Here we have Rene Deco. De Decker, five minutes total. Okay. So I think we might need to share a mic down there. Sorry, Rene. So, Rene, um, that question I was just asking 2D digitization. Do you see that as a way, as a model for scaling up 3D digitization? How, how relevant is the system that you're implementing at the Biodiversity Museum um, to scaling up 3D? I think you mentioned it uh, earlier during the discussion that the running belt we have for the Hibarium sheets, what is needed to make not two digital, uh, two dimensional pictures, but three dimensional pictures of the collections that runs through the belt. Um, 
then you will run production. And if, if it, as I said earlier, if it will not become cheaper, and you have to select to serve the scientific community or, or the audience. There's a big contrast with the discussion today compared to yesterday. Yesterday it was about showing beautiful objects in the most beautiful way to the public. More to the public than to the scientific community. Well, also to the scientific community, but sure. you select a few objects. And now you're talking about mass digitization, preferably three-dimensional, look at what Herb is doing, yeah. for the scientific community. And the scientific community goes back to the amateurs at home. So it's not only those in institutes and universities, but you turn it into uh, citizen science by doing this. Um, so you have to, I think there's, for certain collections, there's definitely space for um, much more efficiency. Okay. I've also have a thought on that. Okay. Uh, so the, what carries over from the 2D digitization to the 3 digitization is sort of the general ideas of automation, of designing workflows, and there's some concepts, conveyor belts uh, that have been around for a long time that will carry through. And the challenge is always if you move to a new type of object, how to, how to take these same ideas. We're probably not going to invent new automation ideas, but take those same ideas and adopt them to new objects, and that's when you make the transition, you have to do that, but you can, again, draw on the same basic concepts of, of automation that René and his team drew on. You would draw on the same ideas and just make sure right. they work for the different objects. So very similar challenges, actually, mm -hmm. between 2D and 3D. Mm -hmm. So we still have to deal with the object handling problem. Mm -hmm. uh, we still have to deal with scanning that object, ideally scanning that object as fast as possible, but also in the safest manner possible. Mm -hmm. How do we post-process that data into something usable, right? And then content delivery. So if we're talking about delivering that content, um, if that delivery system doesn't already exist. So right now we're building the infrastructure for the 3D Explorer. We're hoping to take that further. Um, so I want to throw out another open, oh, time for uh, open questions. Okay, so I'm told it is now time for, I lost track of time. Um, so we're going to um, have a Q&A right now. So does anyone in the audience have questions for the panel here? Hello. I, I was wondering uh, I, why there seems to be an absence of discussion of stereoscopic imaging and whether capturing the data needed to produce stereoscopic images, even if they're not all post-processed for every item are, are not captured at the same time. So to the panel, anyone? So the, the lack of discussion um, for stereoscop stereoscopic uh, capture. So Paul, do you have so, any experience I, mean, I, I, with I think that you know, once you have a 3D model of something, if you want to render it in 2D or render it in 3D stereo or even put on a auto stereoscopic, all the auto multiscopic display, you have the data for it, which is, which is great. And the, the technology for acquiring them you know, leverages, you know, taking pictures of it from multiple points of view, which is basically the process of stereo. So I think everything here is just, uh, you know, infinitely compatible with 3D stereo viewing. Hi, I'm Corey Kilbane. And my question is, as we're gathering all these things, we're gathering all these independent points. As part of this process, are we looking at how do we map relationships between them as part of this whole cataloging process, or are, are we just still to the point like, oh, right, we have all these different bones, we have all these things. Uh, when we present them to, especially to the public, unless people already come to it with context, that's a very daunting challenge. So I was wondering if you guys have thought about this issue and whether or not uh, you have things in the works. Um, we do, actually, and we've done a bunch of experiments, uh, not experiments per se, but classroom experiments with uh, different groups of students uh, using the online data versus the actual uh, bones and things. We have um, a number of examples of uh, education tools for teaching vertebrate osteology and other things within the system. And so we have, we have done quite a lot of that uh, more um, explanatory part of why these databases exist and how to use them. Uh, but it's, I, I admit that it's, it, it, it's in the infancy stage right now. We're, we're not very far along. And uh, many of these projects are, are built from the tech side originally um, and not from the education side. 
And so now we're finding that education requires different things than the original scanning process. And it, it's becoming a, a, a much more important aspect of it. And, but again, it's not well developed. On, on the science side, we have also some, what I consider very interesting methods in sort of in the works to look across, to make comparisons across different species, right? So, I mean, in the past, right, we, we didn't have that data on the species, right? You would sort of when you make comparisons, say, between different species, you pick a couple of measurements, maybe five, maybe 10 or 50 or something like that, and then you have these, these 10 or whatever, 50 numbers that you can compare across species. But now we have 3D models, right? So now we can actually use uh, other methods of data discovery where you can fill the, feed the full richness of the 3D geometry in and then say, okay, find relationship, find trends. Uh, tell me, what do you think if these are the shapes across a thousand species from this kind of animal group or other organisms? Uh, what do you think are the building blocks? Where is the biodiversity? Right? So, so there is methods like that that we can adapt and I think that uh, having this data will make a big difference in actually moving this forward and being able to, to make this relationship. It's also an interesting thing, relationship between sort of the phenome, right, the shapes of the animals and the genome, right? So we have very nice methods, right, that we can get genetic data from organisms now. So we have gigabase pairs of data on an organism. And then on the other side, we have maybe a photo and a couple of measurements, right? So how do you relate giga base pairs of data in the genetic domain to uh, uh, sort of just five or a handful of measurements on the other side. But if we, if we get the full 3D view across different species, across the uh, diversity, then we probably, we have suddenly, we have data that matches in complexity, right? So we can now see relationships between genes, between phenomes that otherwise we would probably never find. And do those systems exist now, Rolf? Do you know of any that you know, the, the idea of pattern recognition um, of three, like 3D objects or unlike 3D objects and combining that also with uh, assets that already exist yes. um, with 2D mm -hmm. digitization. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, there, there, there's these concepts, and the, the, so there's theory behind these things and applications. I mean, the, the problem, I mean, one community that we should also mention right, is sort of the computer graphics, computational shape modeling, this, this community. I think uh, they, they, they have these ideas for methods, but very often when you see publications that are being made, they are tested on a very small set of of shapes, right? because that's right. sort of the standard shape, uh, set of shapes that people work with, and but it and it, it, over the years it has grown and it's actually quite impressive what people have. But it's nothing compared to what is stored along the mall here. Right? So if we had a representative sample out there, uh, we have the concept. I think we have concepts already. But we actually what this could do, this digitization, is it could also trigger a real revolution in what we can actually do with shapes because suddenly people who work on these algorithms, they will actually have much better data to do that work. Right, that's great. Well, we've experimented with it too. And you know, it's the same physics as spatial recognition software. Um, you know, volume and surface shape and other kinds of things. We experiment with it. What, you know, the, the opportunity to be able to scan a small fragment of a bone, run it through our entire system of 10,000 scans, and, and have it do a, some kind of probabilistic comparison. The problem is, is that nobody has a ferro scanner sitting in their lab with a copy of GeoMagic to process the data, and so they can't send us a scan to run through the system. And so if you have a small fragment, they're still bringing it up to the screen and comparing it to all the images. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where we are right now because of, of the costs and expenses right. of scanning at the local level. What you, what you now notice is that um, we are now trying to improve the system to get it digitized, but we probably also have to improve the scientists. Mm -hmm. Because the old generation, <laughs> the old generation, and uh, you're laughing, but I'm, I'm not making jokes. The old generation based taxonomy on morphology. Then DNA came. And there was a whole group of the older generation that thought this is too complex, had not, did not have the training, and couldn't use it. And now you see that in the curriculum for students in, in taxonomy and biology, you almost have to include mm. training on the use of three-dimensional objects. It's a different, a, a next step. And you can have it as beautiful as you can make it, but if the scientists can't use it, it's useless. It's, it's true, Renee, and when we first proposed this, the National Science Foundation, two of the most famous archeologists in the United States called NSF and said, if you fund this, it's gonna destroy science as we know it. 
And NSF said, maybe we should fund this. <laughs> um, and, that's, and that's where it came from. Yeah. Uh, that's so we agree. Um, as an engineer, I really appreciated your comments, uh, Dr. Mueller, about uh, uh, image-based modeling. Um, I work for a company called Simpleware, and we're seeing a huge increase in image-based physics, uh, physics simulations of objects and properties from aerospace, oil and gas, to uh, medical devices, and now more and more interest from museum groups. Um, you know, one group uh, wanted to do a mechanical test on a T-Rex bone, but you're not going to put that in a material testing machine, so they scanned it, created a mesh, uh, did a simulation looking at the stresses and strains within that. Um, I wanted to ask you about how much uh, uh, those requirements are being taken into account when doing these scans because um, the requirements for doing uh, physics-based simulations off of images is quite different uh, and, and uh, quite a bit more detailed and nuanced than just recreating the surface geometry. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, we have a group that did, at Ohio State, they did a, a, a mechanical simulation on the, uh, the ant neck. So they took a micro CT scan of an ant, they reconstructed the geometry and looked at the mechanical loads, but the requirements for those scans are much different than you know, uh, uh, documenting and, and putting uh, uh, geometries in a database. So I wanted to ask how much that's being taken into consideration during this process, if at all. Yeah, I think it's a wonderful question. I mean, for, for our research on the bad biosona, we do take it into account, but as you said, it is sort of, we live in a, in a bubble here, right, that we have this very simple, or, or a relatively simple problem where it's really just the geometry of outer surfaces. But I believe it's a very good point, and we should think very carefully of how to improve that aspect, because again, these, these specimens, they contain value, they contain knowledge for, for information, and uh, the, the process, and again, if we think in terms of the effort, right, the big effort is actually moving the specimen out of where it is stored now, out of the storage jar. So once you, you take that effort, right, it, it really, you should, we should do the best we can to get all, once it's out, right, try to suck all the information that you can get off uh, out of it. So I, I would imagine that maybe in the future what we would be doing is there would not be one scanner, right? there would maybe be a whole array of scanners right? where you can get uh, laser and vision and CT and maybe MRI, uh, things like that, that we can come, come online and just try to get as much data of possi as possible. You never know where it's going to go. So and the, the goal would indeed be, I also like the idea of open data, just make the raw data available even if now nobody has an idea how to use it. Maybe in five, ten years, somebody will, and it, it can trigger some, some developments that we are not thinking about. And I think that that's what we should put, try for. Okay. Thank you, Ralph. So we have another question. Um, I'm Keats Webb from the Smithsonian Museum Conservation Institute. And the first part of my question is asking her um, what the background of the six employees that you have for the democratization of science, what their background is. Is that in scanning? Are there some objects handling? Um, and thinking about who we're going to have to bring in and redefining what the staff of a museum, not completely redefining, but like who's going to do this on staff at a museum or are we contracting to do that? Right. Um, they're trained in-house. Uh, they have uh, their local Idahoans with um, master's and bachelor's degrees in anthropology and art and a few other uh, skills, uh, some ex extensive experience in computer science. I think they all started out as, as, as weekend gamers. Um, they, uh, we well, have uh, one student paleontologist. Uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's an interesting group. Uh, we find that uh, we can take uh, students that are wonderfully interested in the natural history part first and turn them into great scanner technicians and computer modelers uh, easier than we can uh, take a computer science person and teach them how to do natural history through the computer. Um, now, when it comes to handling materials, that's an interesting challenge, and we've had some failures. Um, but we've had uh, a number of in-house training uh, things, and a lot of it we, is a matter of uh, trial and, and, and gladly not very many errors. Um, you know, when it comes to mani uh, moving around using a forklift to manipulate a humpback whale skull, no amount of training is going to help your conservators. <laughs> just doesn't do any good. Yeah. You know, you got an 18 foot whale rib, it's just, you have to get four or five big burly people to pack it around. I mean, that's it. But when it comes to more delicate items, w w they've had some uh, conservation training, some handling training, and they uh, wear the appropriate handwear, and we 
keep things very safe and it, it, it's worked out very well um, for the most part. I'll tell you that one. Um, no, it's worked out very well. And um, it's, but right, it's all, all in-house training. So when you're, you know, basically, and we're, we're actually providing training now. We have interns coming from around the country, actually around the world, to start uh, training our lab to learn the scanning techniques and the so computer software and everything. And it's, uh, and it's mostly museum people wanting to learn the technology, not computer scientists or computer programmers wanting to become natural historians. Thank you, Herb. So we have another question? Okay, so I, I have an observation just to chime in with what everyone else is saying, which is acquisition is easy. It's like, that's pretty much a solved problem. Um, signal to noise ratios are still kind of a problem, which is why you want to hang on to the raw data to do something more interesting later. Um, resolution is still, I think, a problem. as is sound. Um, <laughs> uh, reconstruction takes a lot longer than acquisition, typically. Sorry, reconstruction takes a lot longer than acquisition, typically, so that's a huge problem. Sorry, I wrote these points down so I didn't bubble them. Um, but the, the idea of commodity CT scanning something and sucking all the data out of it strikes me as silly, honestly. I don't think it's doable. Um, what I would say is that it's worth commodity CT scanning stuff as a triage technique to find out whether there's other stuff that you want to scan out afterwards. So the CT scanning is not high enough resolution or? Well, the, the, the point here is that if you scan a whole bat, there's a lot of detail in the cochlea that you're not going to get, sure. for instance, because resolution is limited. So if you want to know, but what you can do is scan the bat and find out whether it looks as though it has a cochlea that you would want to scan, and then go back and do that detail information. But the idea that we're going to scan something once, or surface scan it once, or whatever it is, and suck all the information out of it strikes me as a bit of a non-starter. And it's probably better to focus on a specific research question or a specific use case and get that done and then go back for the other stuff if that's what you okay. want. Okay, yeah, from, from my perspective, 3D with you know, running a number of 3D scanning projects, quite often we'll start off at the research phase. Um, so it's not that we are, one act of capture doesn't live on forever, but quite often one act of capture for a research project um, does have multiple lives, right? So we'll 3D scan um, you know, fossil whales in Chile and we're supporting a research project but at the same time, that's now becoming, at the same time research is happening, that's becoming an exhibit at the Smithsonian and people can view it online. So I do think that it should be pointed out that a 3D model, that's one type of digitization where the uses are many. So I just wanted to, yeah. But. If I can also quickly comment on that. I mean, there's, there will always be sort of a, a borderline as far as you can go, right? Well, sure. And, and once you have set that borderline, you will discover there's some things within these borders and there's always something beyond that border. And my suggestion would be let's, let's push the borderline as far as we can. And, and then I really like your suggestion and say, okay, maybe what you call triage, right? this idea that maybe within your borders you can see an indication that beyond the borders there is something interesting and then you can go in and look for those cases and scan. I, I really like those ideas and it makes, sort of, it makes it even more valuable to say, okay, let's make the borders wide, as wide as we can, then inside, what is inside we have, but maybe we also get an inkling what's outside, and that can help us guide them to extend those borders selectively for research or wherever we, we want to. So, Vince, we've got two more questions back okay, here, great. and Sorry. then we're probably gonna be close on time. Okay, next question. Uh, hi, uh, my name's Ed Triple. I'm at the University of Virginia. Um, I'm kind of curious, I, I really wanted to, to ask Doug Pritchard about this uh, idea of photogrammetry as maybe um, in, in the idea of for at the scale of architecture as uh, something that is democratizing the ability to capture architecture as well. Um, and, and whether or not you, you think that perhaps there's an idea of uh, an architectural taxonomy that can come out of this. And I'm thinking about projects that have scraped Flickr photos and things like that to create 3D models and, and whether or not uh, there is a, an acceptable um, geometric um, 
metric accuracy that's coming out of this kind of work that you think is still relevant, that kind of thing? Um, it's, it's an interesting question. I, I think what we've always strived for uh, with the work is precision and accuracy and resolution. Um, photogrammetry, I think, is, is um, you know, it's a tool of the past and it'll be a tool of the future. I think photogrammetry from my side right now, it's about um, texture acquisition uh, for facades and things like that. Um, ultimately, it just comes down to precision. And I think uh, Brian mentioned this yesterday about a tipping point. I think with scanning technology, we've, we have the tipping point where the resolution and accuracy is there. Um, the photogrammetric approach, um, I don't think is there yet, or at least we haven't you know, used it to that extent. I think the crowdsourcing and all of that um, is, is very empowering. I think you know, it, it's great that we have scanners that cost thousands and thousands of dollars to go on these amazing sites, but you know, in Scotland alone, there's 365 A-listed heritage sites um, to crowdsource those with people with cameras doing simple photogrammetry would be a great idea. Um, and then, you know, apply that around the world. So, to me, ultimately, it comes down to what's the best tool for the job. Okay. Thanks, Doug. So, we have uh, one more question. Yes, I guess, um, you know, thinking about 3D scanning and you can take your ferro scanner or the different scanners and you know, actually take it with you, and it's really the technician that's important at that point. But if you're doing CT scanning and you're setting up a whole rig for doing that, what's the feasibility of loading that into the freight uh, elevator in an archive building and taking it up to the 10th floor and setting up your CT scanner in the hallway? Um, you know, so part of the problem when you get into this very expensive equipment is not everybody's going to buy it, and if you're not going to transport, if the problem is transporting your articles from archive down to your facility in the basement or wherever you're doing your scanning, to move it off site is even worse. So just thinking about the transportability of uh, the CT scanner. Did you want to address that, Ralph? Yeah, it, it is indeed an issue. That's, uh, but you can make this, and, and so we are never we are never going to deal with things that are, but because if you have x-ray, then you will need, if you have x-rays, then you will need lead to shield them, and lead is, has a high mass, right? So that's, that's the problem. So I think the CT scanner that we have, it's about 200 kilograms, uh, but it's, that, that, that's a lot, right? So I cannot take it in my suitcase and carry it with me, but it's still something that can be hauled. So it, it, I think you have a good point. It takes some thought, right? So how can you minimize the distances that the specimens have to travel? I don't see it happening that you could have a high resolution micro CT that you could just sort of carry in your pocket next to the shelf and sort of just plop the specimen in. But I mean, so if you have some mobility, right? So if you have C in your collection, you see some opportunity, some space where you can spare a few 10 square meters. You could set up a, a system, and the system that we have designed with the belts, with the racks, these are sort of modular components. So they could be taken apart and reassembled in maybe two or three days, so right? you could have everything working again. So you could move it from one location to another, but you cannot move it from shelf to shelf. For that, I don't have a solution. Maybe I, I can add to that. Um, there are also challenges. The Leiden University Medical Center is next door to our museum. And in the weekends, no human beings go through the CT scan. So they made it available for our shark collection. And um, so we didn't have to pay anything for the use of the machinery or to transfer it or whatever. It was only time of the staff to bring on a Saturday the sharks to the hospital, to the medical center, <laughs> and back again. So. Did you That's take also video of a way that? of finding partners. <laughs> it takes time, but it doesn't cost money, and a lot of the staff likes to do that because it's a new world to them. They see their sharks in a different way. Um, so look around, and there's more possible than you um, think from a business uh, case point of view. If we can think of a consumer reason to have a CT scanner, that would be great. I think something that uh, might help this general field a lot is that 3D printing is catching on with hobbyists and it's conceivable it could become something that's in the home. And once digital photography became something that you can sell hundreds of millions of cameras every year with, you know, the, the size of a 10 megapixel camera is less than a square centimeter to go in a cell phone at this point. It sounds like there's some fundamental issues with 
radiation about CT scanning <laughs> uh, that need to be well thought taken of. Care of. But uh, you know, can see, things can radically change in their form factors when you have a market that increases by a factor of 100 from what it was before. So maybe that could happen. It would be great. All right. So at this point, we're, we are out of time. But I would like to thank our panelists. I think it was a great discussion. Um,